So that this, I think you did, that this is uh, Alton's grandson, and that they did attend church here. And um, they were children. Uh, they've been part of our VBS program. And for several years, they were uh, members here at the church. So um, anything we can do to help, that would be wonderful. I do want to mention also, and uh, I didn't put it in the bulletin. I uh, meant to, and I did not. But Dirk Wood is going to be here this week. Um, he is in the area of Texas, and um, this is one of the problems with uh, losing his phone number uh, that uh, I've had a hard time touching base with him. I touched base with him the other day, and the, the date that he had open uh, would be was this Wednesday. So he said, I can come visit you um, and just you and Rhonda. I said, no, I, I like that, of course, but I want you to minister to our church. So this Wednesday night, we're going to have pizza in the um, – fellowship room at 630 and then we will come in here for a time with brother Dirk so it won't be your traditional service but he'll come in here with us and he'll minister to us brother Dirk is most of you know him if you don't know who I'm talking about the most outrageous missionary I've ever met in my life he is unique in that um, in, in his boldness and uh, always very much enjoy uh, Reverend Dirk Wood and one of the most bold, one of the, one of the boldest missionaries I've ever known in my life. So I want to encourage you: six thirty pizza. Then we'll come in here for a time with Brother Dirk this Wednesday night at six thirty. So please mark that on your calendars. You will not regret it. And uh, he is absolutely something else. All right. Would you stand with me, please, and let's enter into the, our worship of God. Also, let me say this: that some of our members are not with us. They're out ministering, which I'm very proud of. Um, they are out in Epiphany, uh, specifically Mike and, and uh, his sweet wife, Cindy, and then uh, Shirley and Andy. Uh, at least those four are out working at Epiphany. And the other, others of us here, uh, we've been cleared by uh, background checks to go in and be at the service today for their graduation. So um, that's where uh, some of our folks are, and I just wanted to uh, add our prayers to their effectiveness today as they've been working this weekend. Let's back. Yes, sir, brother. Okay. 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 See, brother Leroy, we'll make sure you get a copy. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're here for you. You are our motive, God. You are the reason that we uh, got up today, set this time aside. You're the reason, God, and you are the paramount, most important uh, reason that we are here. So, Father, we're here, and I pray, God, that you would just receive us as we worship you in our thoughts, in our songs, in our reading, in our meditation, in our motives. We love you, Lord God, and we thank you for your blessings you've bestowed upon us, and God, we just treasure that. And Lord, we just will treasure your word as it is preached, and we will, we will concentrate and meditate in every song and every word that we read today. We love you, Father, and dedicate ourselves to you now. In Jesus' name, God's children said, amen. amen. Remain standing. Let's sing to the Lord, Brother Paul. My Redeemer. I will sing of my Redeemer and his wondrous love to me. On the cruel cross he suffered from the curse to set me free. Sing, oh, sing of my Redeemer. With his blood he purchased me. On the cross, he sealed my pardon, paid the debt, and made me free. I will tell the wondrous story, how my lost estate to save. In his boundless love and mercy, he the ransom freely gave. Sing, oh, sing of my Redeemer. With his blood he purchased me. On the 
cross, he sealed my pardon, paid the debt, and made me free. I will praise my dear Redeemer, hear his triumphant power I'll tell, how the victory he giveth over sin and death and hell sing a sing of my redeemer with his blood he purchased me on the cross he sealed my pardon paid the debt and made me free our redeemer is our theme today Follow with me on the screen as we read the scripture entitled, The New Birth. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell when it sit cometh, and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit." Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. This is the word of God. Amen? Let's continue to sing to the Lord. Okay, here we go. Save, save. We're going to do verses 1 and 2. Everybody sing loud. <laughs> Amen. Well done, Paul. 
Find someone we make yourself. Safe. That's right. Find someone make yourself friendly in Jesus' name. Sacrifices unto the house unto the house. Amen. For ushers to take their places at this time, we'll receive our morning tithes and offerings. Amen. Gentlemen and lady, don't let me forget after service, we have one more to do for Kip. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you and thank you for the gifts and the blessings and the favor that you have given us. We thank you for our country. We repent for our country, God. We thank you for the blessedness that you've given us and our children and our children's children. And God, we return that by being obedient to you and asking God that you'd use us in spreading the gospel to our great, great nation. We love you, Father and ask that you would increase the reach of New Tabor Brethren. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. 
Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. This time I'd like to ask the elders that will be assisting me to pray for folks today. Uh, as we remember those who have needs and need prayer today, uh, my wife is one of them. Uh, Rhonda is uh, really, really struggling with uh, pain and some issues. Uh, they're even mentioning surgery. And uh, we are very seriously looking into that, even though we have about a 50% chance of success rate with the surgery. So if you will remember Rhonda, and uh, if someone would come up in her place, I would appreciate it. And so we can pray and lay hands on her by faith. If you know of any other needs in the church or situations you're aware of that you would like to uh, lift up to prayer, or you yourself might need prayer, I want to encourage you to come at this time as we uh, begin to pray. We believe that the Lord Jesus wants us to pray. It is in the provision, it's in the atonement of the cross that uh, healing is the children's bread, the Bible says. So I want to encourage you, if you would like prayer today, we would love to pray for you. So elders, if you'd please take your places at this time.
Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who've trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Children, if you would please come on down. We have a message for you today. I think Sister Susan is stepping in. <laughs> All righty. Y'all sit down right here. I'm not used to this thing on me. So I already talked to Brendan earlier and asked him if he knew what today was. And he thought a little bit, and I said, you're lucky because you have on green because I was going to pinch you. So, Brendan, what's today? St. Patrick's Day. March the 17th is St. Patrick's Day. Do you know who St. Patrick is? Have you ever heard? We just always celebrate, don't we? We wear green. We eat cabbage. There's a lot of little customs that come with uh, St. Patrick's Day, isn't it? And wearing green is one of the probably the one that you remember the most. Does anybody know where, who St. Patrick is or where he came from? Where do you think St. Patrick came from? Ireland. Ireland. Yeah, we always think, yeah, he was from Ireland. But that's not, I, I had to Google that, and that is not the truth. St. Patrick was from Wales, which is like in England, that area. And at the age of 16, he was taken into slavery. He became a slave. And, and they took him to Ireland. And the whole time he was in, a, a slave, he was not treated well. He had to work really, really hard. And he just cried out to God to save him. And guess what? God did. God was able to set him free, and he went back to where he was from. One Ireland. And he, became a, he went to uh, and became a, a minister, a, a priest. And became a saint. And guess where he went back to after he became a priest? Ireland, yes. And that's where the Irish portion of St. Patrick's Day comes from. And in Ireland, it's supposed to be really, really green. I've never been there before, but I heard that the land is green. And there's a lot of this stuff. What is this? You know what this is called? Come on, Brendan, you know what this is called. <laughs> What's it called? I'm putting you on the spot. You know? Sham? Shamrock? You ever heard of a shamrock? We have sham, we call, don't, don't call this stuff shamrocks. And, and it, it's clover. You know, we go and look for that clover. We look for a four-leaf clover. But when St. Patrick went back to Ireland, he went there for a reason. He went there to spread the word of God the, the wonderful news of Jesus to all of the people that had basically taken him into slavery. So he had forgiven them, and he wanted to teach them about, about God. And he, because he was in Ireland and there was a lot of clover, shamrocks, he used something that they were familiar with to teach about God. Now, when you see this, do you see, how many things do you see here, Blair? How many things are right here? How many things are am I holding in my hand? One. one. It's just one thing. But a lot of people think it, oh, no, it's three. It's one, two, three. But that's not real. That's just, it's really just one thing. And he used the shamrock to teach about the Trinity, about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And he had something that, he, that was available to him to help those people learn about God. It's three in one. It's three parts. But Blair knew that this was just one thing. And we know from Scripture that God is three things in one. He's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. When you were baptized, I was probably here when you two guys were baptized, and the minister said, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
all three in one. You've seen people do, you know, this, do the, do the cross. There, it's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Three things in one. And that's, that's what we need to take away from St. Patrick's Day. Not pinching somebody because they don't have green, but, but go back and pinch anybody that doesn't have anything <laughs> green on, okay? But I'm going to save you guys that don't have on green. I'm going to give you all something to put on your clothes so that all day long today you can wear this if you don't have anything green. I bought a bunch of them because they were a dollar. Some of y'all know my obsession with the dollar store. Come here. Here you go. I'm a dick. There you go. You can put that on and nobody will pinch you today. And I noticed Kate wore green today. I, <laughs> I don't have to give any to Kate. So there's, a, there's some shamrocks on your little sticker sheet. And when you look at that shamrock, from now on, I want you to remember what St. Patrick was teaching the people in Ireland. That there's three in one. Three things. God the Father... God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. That's pretty cool. I didn't know that story until Miss Shirley asked me to do the sermon on March the 17th. I thought, oh, that's St. Patrick's Day. I'm going to see what that's all about and see if, and I'm a Google expert too. And I just Googled children's sermon for St. Patrick's Day, and all this information was out there. And it could be lessons about forgiveness because St. Patrick forgave the people that took him into slavery. It can be the lesson about the Trinity that I did. So that's what we need to take from this today is that God is three in one, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's a pretty good lesson. All right. Okay. Anybody want to pray or you all want me to pray? Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you today for St. Patrick and for his ability to go back and forgive the people that took him into slavery. We thank you for the lesson of the Trinity, that there is one God, one Father, one Son, and it's all the same thing. We ask that you protect these children as they get back to their routine on tomorrow, and we ask that you bless them with everything that they do in their lives. We ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. Stand with me, please, congregation. Guys, you know where to go, right here. We all learn something in children's messages, don't we? That's pretty neat. When you first have that up, what came to my mind was sham wow. But it's not sham wow, it's a sham rock. It's pretty awesome. We want to bless you. We want to go well with you. We want you to prosper. We want you to be happy. And what's more than that, God wants that a whole lot more than we do. So we're going to agree with the Lord that God will touch you and protect you guys. Stretch your right hand, a promise, a blessing to these good, good young people. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for your grace and your mercy, your power and your provision to be upon these young people. Father, I speak security over their lives, protection, Lord. I pray, God, that you would be with them, that everywhere they go, they will walk in health and happiness and in contentment. I pray, God, that your joy, your power, your promises would be manifested in their lives, and they would grow up to be very productive and powerful individuals for the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we thank you for your favor and your blessing upon them. In Jesus' name we speak these things. And God's children said, Amen and Amen. All right. I got something for you, and I got something for you afterwards. Hey, buddy, you're a good man. Amen. All right. Next week, I begin something very important. Um, we begin a series on the Ten Commandments. Um, this is very important because the church is losing um, the culture war. Um, we are leading the United States away from God with decisions that we have been making recently. I'm talking about the church in general in America. And um, very concerned about these things. And I believe that an assumption from the pulpit that we all understand everything about um, what God has said and what the Ten Commandments mean, I think is, is faulty on the part of the clergy. So I want to remind you of the things that God has uh, told us to do. And uh, as I told the confirmants today, they are the Ten Commandments, not the Ten Suggestions. We all know this. So next week, very important, bring somebody, bring a friend, 
and uh, we will begin this series on the Ten Commandments. Today, I want to talk about a principle and a word that came from Jesus' mouth, and it's entitled Born Again. What does this mean? Where do we go with this? And how many people are really born again? John chapter 3, verses 1 through 10, let's go to the Word of God. There was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, we've read this, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. Well, that's obvious. For no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Verily, verily, very truly, I, t- I say to you, no one can see the kingdom of heaven of God without being born from above or born again, as King James uh, coins it. Nicodemus said to him, how can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and of spirit. What is born of flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above or born again. The wind blows where it chooses and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? And this is interesting as Jesus responds to him and where I believe the church in America is, the leadership especially. Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel? And yet do not understand these things. This is a very, very serious issue in our world today. And I believe that if we're born of God, if we're born again by the Spirit of God, that we will understand some things of the Spirit. We'll be able to flow more with what God is saying and know His nature. There are so many religious people that cannot understand the things of the kingdom of God. Very foreign to them. We are so fleshly minded. We're so involved in what we want, what we need, what we desire, that we miss the things of God and the things that He has already said. Not new principles, but we are mending the things that He has already said. Change in a person's life follows our rebirth in the Spirit. There is no change in your life unless you have been born again. Now, let me make this statement. Born again is not a Baptist term. It's not an assembly of God phrase or a church of God phrase or a church of the Nazarene concept. It is a biblical principle for us to be born again. Sometimes we think that because a certain denomination or group of people say this all the time, it is theirs. This is biblical. It is scriptural for us to be born again. That means that change takes place in a human life. I've told you many times that I'm opposed to the view that people say, well, that's just who I am, it's what I'm like, and I, you know, you can't, I can't change, it's just who I am. If you've been born again, that means that the Spirit of God has come into your life and He changes us from the inside out. There are many different changes, changes of motives, sometimes a change of personality from someone who was always pursuing things that are wrong, to someone that's saying, I want to be right, I want to follow God. And this is a supernatural intervention into someone's life. Many of you today can tell me that when you were born again, when you accepted Christ as your Savior, you noticed some changes. You noticed some things that were going against what you used to want to do, and now you weren't interested in those things anymore. It doesn't come by mental discipline. It is by the Spirit of God as He begins to interact with your flesh and begin to cleanse and sanctify your life so that you can be useful to Him. Like a butterfly from a caterpillar, we experience a metamorphosis. Now, I've got a a little image of a butterfly here, if you can put that up, how beautiful this is and what it used to look like. I I didn't get an image of what it used to look like, but everybody, you've seen the caterpillars, these ugly little wormy looking things and how that this can come from that. This metamorphosis, this physical change that takes place is nothing short of miraculous in the animal kingdom, in the insect world. A Christian, when we come to know Jesus Christ as our Savior and we are born again, this same thing happens in our spirit. 
We become completely different, and we are, we are just completely changed from what we used to be. It doesn't mean that, that our flesh doesn't still want to do some things, but our spirit man has been born inside of us that opposes the things that are destructive to your life and to your purpose. There is a change that takes place. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17. We've read this before. This is the scripture of the day in your bulletin. Let's read this again out loud. You ready? So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. This is contrary to the mindset that this is just who I am. It's just the way I'm like, uh, you know, it's just me. No, that is unbiblical according to Scripture. It says you're a new creation in Christ. Everything old, the things that you thought were yourself, that's passed away now. Now everything has become new. New life, new creation, new direction, new motive, new purpose. This is what happens when we are born again, and this is what Nicodemus, a religious man who was a doctor in the law, could not understand in his natural mind. And Jesus marveled at him being a teacher, a gatekeeper of the spiritual things in Israel, and he could not comprehend this. He did not understand this principle. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, we hear where Paul tells us, speaking of of this new life. Do not be conformed to this world. Don't roll with, with the way things are going. Be careful what you accept and what you adopt as who you are. But be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Without this new creation, without this transformation, you're not going to get things. You're not going to understand them. They're going to be foreign to you. It's going to be, what? I don't understand. If this doctrine of the law didn't get it, why do we think we will? Without the Spirit of God being infused into our life, and without us inviting Him to say, make me a new creation. David said, create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew within me a right spirit. David was responding to his dastardly, devious, murderous sin that he engaged in with Bathsheba and against her husband, Uriah the Hittite. You see, it's important that the Spirit of God be infused in our life because you can't do it by yourself. We need to be born again. We need to renew our spirits in Jesus Christ. In about 2005, American scientists pitched research in the Pentagon. They said, we want to introduce an airborne virus to Afghanistan troops that would attack their religious fanatic gene. We want to introduce a virus that is airborne. We'll drop it from planes, and we believe this will work, that this will attack a gene that will cause them to strap bombs on themselves and go blow up people. When I heard this, I thought, wow. You know, you hear a lot of this stuff about a zombie apocalypse, and I think that's ridiculous. Boy, if something like that ever happens, that's scary. That makes me nervous because I am considered a religious fanatic in some circles. Some people in other churches consider my stands on social issues as fanaticism and extremists. And it makes me wonder, man, if, if we start doing stuff like this. You see, this is America's attempt or certain scientists' attempt to change people. Uh, you know, here's what we'll do. We'll, we'll just introduce this virus, and then we'll take that out. We don't have to worry about that type of behavior anymore. You can't control that type of behavior with a physical virus. It can only be taken care of. It can only be cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ, not by the powder of some airborne virus. Jesus is the only one that can change a life. I could probably ask several people here today, say, would you stand and just tell us how Jesus has changed your life? When I'm witnessing to people, telling them about Jesus for the first time, especially to unbelievers, people that don't believe in God, one of the most important things I tell them, one of the most convincing things I can tell them is Jesus changed my life. I didn't adopt a certain set of religious laws and rules and say, I'm going to do my best to live up to these things. No. Jesus Christ came in to live with me, and His Spirit is inside of me. 
and He has changed my motives, my thoughts. He convicts me of sin. He is the one that challenges my spirit. You see, this is evidence of a change, of a born-again experience, not an airborne virus dropped in to change how we behave. That's not how this works. Now, a lot of people think that they think when you become a Christian, you know, that things all get really good and everything is fine. Let, I, don't want to, I don't want to put that out there. I want to say that after this change that you never tempted again and that, that you're just perfect from here on out. One of the things that, if you put that first image up, that, that video right quick, we think that this is how it goes. You know, we get in our red sports car that we call Christianity. We're just cruising down the road, man. We've, we've got our performance chip in, installed, you know, and we got that extra horsepower. I mean, it's just happening, right? This is just great, and this is just a wonderful life. But the truth is, the Christian walk and the Christian ride is more like this next image I want to give you, this next video. That's sort of really what it's like there, amen? I mean, boy, we're just trying to get down the road, and we're just getting beat to death sometimes. But notice what that buggy is still doing. It is going forward. It is running up against rocks and hills and potholes and no telling what going through scorpions and snakes, but it's moving. Keep moving, brother. Don't, don't you dare stop on me. It keeps moving forward. That's what the Christian life is like. You notice he's got the helmet of salvation on there, don't you, amen? All right, you can, you can take that off there. This is more what it's like to walk as a Christian life because this world is dangerous. It's foreign to us. It's against us. It fights us at every turn, but yet we move forward. We continue going. If you think it's like the bed experience, think again. It is not like that, and I'm telling you, you know better than that. You live in this world. We need to continue to advance. We need to continue, even though it's bumpy, even though there are problems there, there are risks, we keep advancing for the cause of Christ because the Spirit of God compels us to do so. Some Christians, when they get in a crisis, they want to resurrect the old man that's supposed to be passed away. Yeah. Somebody does something new, they cut you off in traffic or they, they cheat, you in a business or whatever, you want to tell them off, don't you? You want to let them have it. So what do we do? In order to do that, we get the old man back, we get our AED set, and we put the old paddles on him, and we resurrect the old man because somebody got to put that person in their place. Amen? CPR on what's supposed to be dead, we resurrect it, and then we walk in the flesh again. Let that man die. Let, let that man stay dead. Amen? I'm talking about the evil man that is inside of us. The Bible tells us that we are reborn. We are new in Christ. We've been raised with Him. We have died with Him. Now we're raised with Him in newness of life. Don't resurrect. Don't give CPR. Let Him lay dead. Some people walk around with their dead man, dragging him around. And the, man, as soon as something happens, they were, whoop, whoop, whoop. What did you say? <laughs> then we bring him back to life and then sick him on that person. That's who we used to be. It's not who we are now. We walk in newness of life. Here's what God says in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. Then we'll read 11 through 12. What then are we to say? Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin, we're supposed to be dead to sin, how can we go on living in it? Remember, you're a new creation. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus we're baptized into his death. Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in, here's that word, newness of life. Not the same old, same old. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed. And we might no longer be enslaved to sin. Those impulses, those reactions, those thoughts. For whoever has, has died is freed from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Now let's go to verse 11 and 12. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Born again. Therefore, do not allow sin 
to exercise dominion in your mortal bodies, to make you obey their passions. Why? You're better than that. There's a calling on your life. You've been raised with Christ in newness of life. You've been born again. So the Holy Spirit, through this Word of God, says, Be ye born again. The world needs you to be born again. Born of the Spirit. They need to see a difference between you and what they are already experiencing. Because if God's power can't change your life, then what, you know, why do they need it? One of my favorite stories of Dirk, I may ask him to repeat this story. It's a fascinating story. He's, he's preaching. And while he's preaching, this man is cursing him. And he keeps preaching. The man keeps cursing him. Vile words. And finally, Dirk just turns to the man and points to him in front of the crowd and says, Sir, are you a Muslim? And the guy continues to curse him. He says, Sir, I'm asking you a question. Are you Muslim? The guy refused to answer and kept cursing. He says, Sir, I understand if you're Muslim. I'd be ashamed of it too. That got a response. The guy says, Yeah, I'm a Muslim. How do you know? He said, I can tell by your filthy mouth. And here's what Dirk said. He said, your God didn't change your life. He didn't, take, he didn't change your language. He didn't change anything about you. He said, I used to talk like you did, but I don't anymore. You know why? Because Jesus has made me new. He's transformed my life. Can you see the difference here? He continued to talk about how that difference and that change that was in his life. Many of you have seen, the, I think, the Lee Remini uh, Scientology documentary that's been coming on television. One of the things I've noticed from these former Scientologists is their language. I mean, they're dropping bombs on television. They're saying all these things. I'm thinking, okay, so they were in a church of Scientology. Now they're out of it. But nothing has ever changed in their life. You can tell there's not that born-again experience, that supernatural butterfly experience that takes place in their life that we have as Christians. And again, your most powerful witnessing tool is what Jesus has done for you. How has he changed your life? How has he transformed you? Be ye born again. The Word of God tells us. And then, these are key to us walking in this new life. Welcome God's Spirit in your life. Don't devise escape hatch doors to try to get out of it, to do what you want to do. Don't drag that dead body around wanting to resurrect it. Welcome God's Spirit. Welcome His culture. Welcome His Word into your life. Spirit of God, I'm with you to the end, all the way. I'm, I am completely sold out to hold out for you. I'm with you all the way. Then, when these things happen, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Practice your faith. Talk to the Lord. Renew those old thoughts. Reject them. Renounce them. If you, if you remember during communion often, I'll make this statement. Father, we renounce our sins. We declare them an the enemy against our spirit and our purpose and our life. That is the part of being transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then the old is gone, the new is here. No one will have to tell you that has taken place. It will be obvious, the transformation in your life. Oh, you'll still be bumping down the road, but you'll be going forward. The engine is, is in drive and you're moving forward. You don't need a virus to kill a bad gene, my friend. You need the blood of Jesus to wash you and to make you clean. This is what we need, is God's power in our life. I want you, in conclusion, to repeat this with me. I want you to say, I am a new creation. Say it. I, am a new creation. I want you to say, I have been transformed by the Holy Spirit. I have been transformed by the Holy Spirit. And finally, I am born again. I am born again. Let's say those again. Number one, I am a new creation. I have been transformed by the Holy Spirit. I am born again. These are biblical principles and promises that are available to you now through His Word. All we have to do is reach out by faith, accept them, and embrace them, and God will change our lives. And we can walk in newness of life. Not just a one-time experience, but it's a daily walk where we walk transformed and changed by His power. I was talking to someone the other day about when they're around other people in the workplace and the language that people use. 
the boys would tell me that at school, you know, everybody talked that way. Even some teachers were dropping bombs, which was unheard of when I was a kid in school. When you don't use, listen very carefully to me, when you don't use that language, when you choose not to make those exclamations, there is a determined, specific, definite difference between you and, and public. They notice that you're not talking that way. Think about that. They, it's something different to them. As different as it is, is for you to hear it, it is different for them not to hear it from you. You don't have to say, I'd appreciate it if you don't sleep that kind of language around me. You know, maybe you do that. Maybe. I don't do that anymore. You know what I do? I just don't use it. I don't repeat it. I don't say it. And when I leave their presence, they probably think, I noticed that. Something's different. You know? Maxine doesn't talk that way. She doesn't say those things that everybody else in the office does. You don't, do you, Maxine? <laughs> and they notice there's a difference. Guys, it's so easy. And Rhonda said that if we train our boys right, then it'd be so easy for them to be exceptional for the things that they refuse to engage in. It's getting easier and easier in this world to be exceptional. And what, I'm, what your preacher is telling you today is if you don't cuss, that's a witness for Christ. Think about that one. You stand out if you choose not to use the language of other people. Well, preacher, they're just adjectives. Mm -hmm. They're adjectives. They're exclamations. Sometimes there's only one way to say it. Let's use that. Okay. But listen, they don't want you to say it. They expect you not to say it. And if sin causes my brother, I, I, I'm sorry, if eating meat offered to idols causes my brother with a weaker conscience to sin, then I will not eat meat offered to idols. So I'm going to do my best to make sure my language is acceptable in God's eyes and a witness to other people. You can show that difference and speak to their hearts, and eventually they're going to identify you as someone that's different. And it won't take them long. They'll figure, I wonder if they're a Christian. And then that gives you an open door to begin to tell them, God has changed my life, even my language, because th my God is powerful enough to do that. If you're born again, you can do that. Bow your heads with me and close your eyes. If you're here today and you're not sure, you're like Nicodemus, you're religious, you love the things of God and you want to serve him, but this born-again thing, maybe I haven't done such a good job with that. Maybe I need to practice my faith more. Maybe I need to stand out. The world needs there to be a difference. If they're going to follow, they need to see something that is different than they are. Today, I want to encourage you. All you have to do is welcome him into your life and in your spirit. Change my life. Make me new. Create within me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew within me a right spirit. I want to be useful to God. If that's you today, without raising your hand, without identifying yourself, I want to pray for you, and I want you, if this is, is who you are, you want the Lord to transform your life, I want to lead you in prayer. As a matter of fact, to make it even easier, I want everyone in the room to repeat this prayer after me. Stand with me, please, everyone. Repeat this prayer for me. Brother Paul, if you guys can come up and prepare, I surrender all. Let's pray. Pray after me. Dear Jesus, I know you have the power to change lives. I ask, Lord, and I invite you to come into me and change my life. Make me new. Renew a right spirit within me. I welcome you, Holy Spirit. I want to be useful to you, oh God. Thank you for coming into my life and transforming me. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord God. Brother Paul, lead us in this song in conclusion. I surrender all.
I yeah. give myself Yes, Lord God. Today. Yes, Jesus. Fill me with thy love and power. Let thy blessing fall on me. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior. We surrender, Father. We surrender to your will and to your way. Father, change our hearts. Change our lives. We welcome your Holy Spirit to walk and to communion with us on a day-by-day, hour-by-hour, minute-by-minute basis. We love you, Father. We dedicate ourselves and our hearts and our lives to you. In Jesus' name, God's children who agreed said, amen and amen. You may be seated. Ushers, if you please take your places. Receive that offering, and after we finish the offering, um, ushers just take the plates and put them on the pews as we give to the Lord. Amen. Dirkwood tonight, I'm um, tonight, Wednesday, 6.30, pizza first, and come over here for a, for a session with Dirkwood, amen. You got some, we got some video for you, some images there, when Dirk was on the, um, the Barry Moore show, which is a big, yeah, that dancing guy there, and uh, he invited Dirk to come on to his show, it, sort of the, um, uh, I don't know, it's the, it was the, Jimmy Fallon of, of England, and uh, he was very famous for his boldness in, in downtown London. And uh, this guy here, Dirk told me a lot about that guy, and that about fits him there. And, and, uh, but Dirk came on to that uh, program talking about his boldness and his witness for Jesus Christ. And, and this is Dirk with him on the show. But um, anyway, I encourage you to come, bring a friend. Uh, I love that guy. He's a good, good fella. Loves the Lord with all of his heart. All right. Brethren, thank you so much. God bless you. You'll be dismissed. Let's have a wonderful day.